Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we will be talking about the comparable companies analysis. And this is a comprehensive video covering the start to finish analysis and how to really build up and select the companies that you're gonna be comparing the, your target company to and conducting the actual analysis using the necessary multiples. So it is a very long but comprehensive video and I would recommend that you kind of watch it in parts. And so this is also chapter one of the investment banking valuation, leverage buyouts and mergers and acquisitions second edition book by Joshua Rosenbaum and Joshua Pearl. This is an excellent textbook. I've read majority of the textbooks that are out there with regards to investment banking, and this is probably the most comprehensive and easy to understand kind of guide to learning the industry and learning the technical skills needed to build up a comparable company's analysis, a precedent transactions analysis, a discounted cash flow analysis, building up you know leverage buyout decisions, uh, buy side and sell side decisions as well. So the textbook is incredibly valuable for anyone entering the industry or preparing for interviews. So I've provided a link in the video description where you can go to Amazon and purchase the textbook if you are interested. But in this video, we're going to be talking about the comparable companies analysis. And let's get started. So the comparable companies analysis is one of the primary methodologies used for valuing a given focus company. It provides a market benchmark against which a banker can establish valuation for a company and is frequently used for various mergers and acquisition situations, initial public offerings, restructurings, and investment decisions. The foundation for trading comps is built upon the premise that similar companies provide a highly relevant reference point for valuing a given target due to the fact that they share key business and financial characteristics, performance drive and risks. Therefore, the banker can establish valuation parameters for the target by determining its relative position among peer companies. It focuses on reflecting the current value based on market conditions, and in some cases, it is more relevant than a discounted cash flow analysis. And really, the key to understand is that the comparable company analysis is another tool in the toolkit of an investment banker or analyst that is valuing a company. You want to combine the comparables companies analysis with that of a, the precedent transactions analysis with the discounted cash flow analysis and any other type of uh, valuation kind of procedure that you want to follow. So it just is another point of view, another perspective for which you can refer to. So when you actually give your final valuation uh, assumption and judgment, you can stand by that and defend your, your, your projection. Okay, so the comparable companies analysis is split into five steps. You first select the universe of comparable companies. You then locate the necessary financial information. You then spread the key statistics, ratios, and trading multiples. You then benchmark the comparable companies. And finally, you determine the relevant valuation. So a quick summary of those steps. In step one, your, the selection of a universe of comparable companies for the target is the foundation for performing trading comps. While this exercise can be fairly simple and intuitive for companies in certain sectors, it can prove challenging for others whose peers are not readily apparent. In step two, once the initial comparable universe is determined, the banker locates the financial information necessary to analyze the selected comparable companies and calculate or spread the key financial statistics, ratios, and trading multiples. In step three, the banker is now prepared to spread key statistics, ratios, and trading multiples for the comparable universe. This involves calculating market valuation measures such as enterprise value and equity value, as well as key income statement items such as EBITDA and net income. And so we'll actually go through each, and this is probably the, the, the longest portion of the video. We're gonna be spending a lot of time on step three to really understand each of these metrics so that when you are in an interview or you are speaking to someone, not only are you regurgitating information, but you understand that information which you're speaking about. Okay. In step four, the next level of analysis requires an in-depth examination of the comparable companies in order to determine the target's relative ranking and closest comparables. Benchmarking serves to determine the relative strength of the comparable uh, companies versus one another and the target. The similarities and discrepancies in size, growth rates, margins, and leverage, for example, among the comparables and the target are closely examined. And so this is where really experience as a senior investment banker comes in. Not only are you kind of inputting the financial information, which is relatively easy and any analyst can do that, but you're also reading that information. You're making and you're interpreting what it means, which ones are more relevant and how does that impact the overall valuation. 
In step five, you're finally determining the valuation. So the trading multiples of the co comparable companies serve as the basis for deriving a valuation range for the target. The banker typically begins by using the means and medians for the relevant trading multiples, such as Evira Ebra, as the basis for extrapolating an initial range. The high and low multiples for the com uh, comparable universe provide further guidance in terms of a potential ceiling or floor. So let's look at step one. The selection of a universe of comparable companies for the target is the foundation for performing trading comps. To do so, you have to study the target company thoroughly by considering both its business and financial profile. And this is important. A lot of the times when people kind of rush through this analysis, the due diligence portion is always overlooked because they simply assume that, okay, because this company is in the oil sector, I can compare it to any other company in the oil sector. No, that's not the case. You want to understand its subset. You want to understand its products and services, its customers and end markets, its distribution channels, its geography. There are so many things and so many differences within the business profile alone, which could really eliminate some businesses, which initially would be considered uh, comparable companies, right? And that's the same thing for financial profile. Maybe the size, profitability, growth profile, return on investment or credit profile might be different. And therefore, it would impact the market's valuation of that company and therefore it would not be useful. At the end of the day, the comparable company analysis is based 100% on the selection universe. You need to select the right businesses to compare the target to. If you're comparing them to the wrong businesses, then you're going to get the wrong valuation. And therefore you have failed to offer a strong service to your client or whatever you're trying to do. Okay. At its base, the methodology for determining co comparable companies is relatively intuitive. Companies in the same sector, or preferably subsector, with, with similar size tend to serve as good companies. While this can be fairly si a simple exercise for companies in certain sectors, it may prove challenging for others whose peers are not readily apparent. For a target with no clear publicly traded comparables, the banker seeks companies outside the target's core sector that share business and financial characteristics on some fundamental level. The process of learning the in-depth story of the target should be exhaustive, as this information is essential for making decisions regarding the selection of appropriate comparable companies. Towards this end, the banker is encouraged to read and study as much company and sector specific material as possible. The actual selection of comparable companies should only begin once this research is completed. And so I've already emphasized this point. It is important to conduct your due diligence on the target first, understand its business and financial profile, and then begin to determine what the selection universe and the comparable universe is. Okay, so let's look at the business profile on each of the d different considerations. From a sector perspective, it refers to the industry or markets in which a company operates. A company's sector can be further divided into subsectors, which facilitates the identification of the target's closest comparables. The products and services are the company's products and services are the core of its business. Accordingly, companies that produce similar products or provide similar services typically serve as good comparables. Products are commodities or value added goods that a company creates, produces or refines. So in I'm nothing's on the top of my head, but this is quite important. You have to identify whether the product is a commodity or value added good. If you are comparing it to a company or if you're comparing two companies where one, uh, it, it produces a commodity, which, you know, they're price takers versus price setters, then that analysis is unfair because at the end of the day, the core, the core of its business model is dependent on two different things. You know, in one case, the the company is susceptible to the commodity price and its supply and demand within the market, whereas in the other, they're setting their price because they're producing a value-added good. So it wouldn't be fair to compare a company that produces commodities with one that produces value-added goods. And that's important to realize. With regards to customers, a company's customers refer to the purchasers of its products and services. Companies with a similar customer base tend to share similar opportunities and risks. For example, companies supplying automobile manufacturers abide by certain manufacturing distribution requirements and are subject to the automobile purchasing cycles and trends. So this is important. You need to understand who are buying these products. Where is the demand coming from for their service or good? Where are the key drivers of revenue growth? Are they in cyclical industries or in stable industries? Are they growing or declining, right? Are, is there cost cuts or, you know, are, are they very, are they spending lavishly, right? 
and also the end markets. It's different from customers. A customer's a company's end markets refer to the broad underlying markets in which it sells its products and services. For example, a plastics manufacturer may sell into several end markets, including automotive, construction, consumer products, medical devices, and packaging. End markets need to be distinguished from customers. For example, a company may sell into the housing end market, but to retailers or suppliers as opposed to home builders. So within each end market, there are different customers and also different cyclicalities within it for those customers. So relative to big box retailers and, you know, stay at home moms and dads who might demand your products, each have different buying capacities, which you need to understand. And that's why the extensive analysis of not only the target company, but the comparables company is very important. Okay, distribution channels are the avenues through which a company sells its products and services to the end user. As such, they are a key driver of operating strategy, performance, and ultimately value. Companies that sell primarily to the wholesale channel, for example, often significantly are different from organizational and cost structures from those selling directly to retailers or end users. In addition, geography, companies that are based in and sell to different regions of the world often differ substantially in terms of fundamental business drivers and characteristics. They, these may include growth rates, macroeconomic environment, competitive dynamics, paths to market, organizational cost structure, and potential opportunities and risks. So if you were to analyze a company that, yes, serves the same, uh, uses the same distribution channels, serves the same customers at the in the same end markets, but one serves the Canadian side and one serves the um, the German side of the market, well, all of a sudden things change because they are on different economic paths, even though from a global perspective, yes, you know, when both of them are doing well, you know, they're both increasing, but they're increasing at different rates of growth and different things impact the general macroeconomic environment of those markets. So you need to understand those differences. And, you know, if they're clear, big differences in performance, then it might not be smart to compare those two companies and rather find a company that also operates in, in, and serves the Canadian market. Okay, So from a financial profile, uh, size is typically measured in terms of market valuation as well as key financial statistics. Companies of similar size in a given sector are more likely to have similar multiples than companies with significant size discrepancies. In addition, profitability, a company's profitability measures its ability to convert sales into profit. Profitability ratios employ a measure of profit in the numerator, such as gross profit, EBITDA, EBIT or net income, and sales in the denominator. So it's very important to understand the profitability of a company. In addition, there's a growth profile, a company's growth profile as determined by its historical and estimated future financial performance is a critical driver of valuation. Equity investors reward high growth companies with higher trading multiples than slower growing peers. In addition, the return on investment ROI measures a company's ability to provide earnings to its capital providers and the company's credit profile refers to its credit and worthiness as a borrower. It is typically measured by metrics relating to a company's overall debt level, as well as its ability to make interest payments, and it reflects key company and sector specific benefits and risks. The key comment I would make with regards to the business and financial profile is usually if you spend a lot of time on the business profile and find companies that really share a lot of sim similarities with regards to the end markets, the distribution channels, and the customers that are buying their products, usually the financial analysis will follow f through and it will be quite similar as well. As long as they, are, they have the similar size, usually their credit profiles are the same because they're dependent on the same customers. Whereas if you were to compare uh, companies that don't follow the same business profile, but follow the same financial profile, then the analysis is different, right? And the credibility of your projection might decline. But again, this all comes down to experience within that industry and seeing multiple and doing multiple comparable companies analysis so that you can really make sure that you're confident in whatever you're standing by, right? So. Now you screen for the comparable companies. Once the target's basic business and financial characteristics are researched and understood, the banker uses various resources to screen for potential comparable companies. At the initial stage, the focus is on identifying companies with a similar business profile. Investment banks generally have established lists of comparable companies by sector containing relevant multiples and other financial data, which are updated on a quarterly basis and for appropriate company-specific actions. 
An additional source for locating comparables is in the proxy proxy statement for a relatively recent M&A transaction in the sector, as it con contains excerpts from a fairness opinion, an FA. As the name connotes, a fairness opinion comments on the fairness of the purchase price and the deal terms offered by the acquirer from a financial perspective. Furthermore, equity research reports, especially known as initiating coverage, often explicitly list the research analyst's views on the target's comparables and or primary competitors. So there are a lot of different sources to really determine where the comparable companies, what, what comparable companies are, right? So you have, uh, just reviewing them one more time, you know, you can research yourself and determine what uh, comparable companies make sense. You can also ask your investment bank and research equ equity research department to see if they already have an existing list of comparable companies. You can also look at the fairness opinion of recent transactions in the M&A space, or you can read other equity research reports provided by other investment banks that have initiated coverage on the re respective target to see what they consider to be the primary competitors for that company, okay? In step two, you're now locating the necessary financial information. Some relevant sources for locating the necessary financial information to calculate key financial statistics, ratios, and multiples for the selected comparable companies are one, the 10K, the annual report, the 10Q, the quarterly report, the AK, which is a current update, updated report for whatever performance of the company. There's also proxy statements, which are documents shared to shareholders before you know, a shareholder meeting. There's equity research provided by investment banks. And there are financial services like Bloomberg and Thomson Reuters, which provide a lot of information. Really, you know, you'll probably be using a lot of Bloomberg, but also you'll be looking into the 10K, the, the, the 10Q and the AK to really understand the current financial position of whatever company you're researching and at the same time, the comparables. Okay, so here's a more a, a bigger summary of that. So, you know, for income statement data such as sales, gross profit, EBITDA, so on, you can just look at the 10K and the 10Qs. Uh, for balance sheet information, you can look at the 10Ks and the 10Qs. Uh, for share price data and current credit ratings, you can go to the rated agency's websites or Bloomberg to really understand that information. So there are different sources from different things, and that's really what an analyst does. Like they're, they're a jack of all trades in the sense that they're gonna be hopping between different inf information sources and bringing them all together to really sum them up in a report. And so that's really the value of the the analyst. Now step three, once the necessary information for each of the comparables has been located, it is entered into an input page. This input page is designed to assist the banker in calculating the key financial statistics, ratios, and multiples for the comparables universe. The input data, in turn, feeds into output sheets that are used to benchmark the companies. Let's now look at the different financial statistics and ratios. So. Key financial statistics that are used in the comparable companies analysis are from a size perspective, you have the equity value and enterprise value, you have sales, gross profit, EBITDA, EBIT. From profitability, you look at gross profit, EBITDA, EBIT. From uh, growth profile, you look at the historical and estimated growth rates, return on investment, on investment. you look at re return on investment, cap invested capital, return on equity, and return on assets. And from a credit profile, you can look at the leverage ratios, the coverage ratios, and the credit ratings. And so we're going to go through all of these multiples and, and ratios to give you the formula so that you can refer to them when you are conducting your comparables companies analysis. Okay. So first, equity value. Equity value is the value represented by a given company's fully diluted shares outstanding multiplied by the current share price. When compared to other companies, the equity value does not offer much more than a measure of relative size because of the capital structure bias. And we'll talk about that because that's quite important. So essentially, equity value is the share price times fully diluted shares. And this is important. It's not basic sh uh, uh, shares outstanding, which is you know displayed on Google Finance under shares shares, it's fully diluted shares. So it's basic shares outstanding plus in the money options and warrants plus in the money convertible securities. And so we're going to be looking at how we can calculate the fully diluted shares in the following slides. Now this is something that I learned while reading the textbook. For insight, 
on Alp's absolute and relative market performance, the banker looks at the company's current share price as a percentage of its 52-week high. This is a widely used metric that provides perspective on valuation, engages current market sentiment and outlook for both the individual company and its broader sector. And so I actually did this for you know the kind of um, base metal sector within the Canadian market. And so I took the target company, which was first Quantum Minerals, and I compared it to you know comparable companies like Silver, Wheat and Corp, London um, Mining Corporation, and, and Tech Resources, right? And so what I did is I took their 52-week high and divided the, the current share price by that 52-week high and saw the percentage, where does it stand relative to that performance, you know, one year out. And so looking at that performance, we see that for first quantum minerals, they are significantly below the percentage of 52 week high of the share price which is 69.58%. And this gives you great insight into if the company is in line with its peers from a performance and current market value perspective or if there are individual things that are affecting the company's performance and therefore you should be spending more time on that. Right? The ideal scenario is where you're comparing a target company with companies that you've decided are the comparables and all of them are within maybe a 5 plus um, a kind of deviation uh, percentage range, right? So, you know, if the average is 70, you know, the percentage of a 52 week high is between 65% and 75%. Then we can say that both from a, a market performance perspective and from a business and financial profile perspective, they are very similar. And that's what we're looking for. And this is actually quite a cool thing that I learned myself. Okay, so now let's look at the calculation of fully diluted shares outstanding. A company's fully diluted shares are calculated by adding the number of shares represented by its in the money options, warrants, and convertible securities to its basic shares outstanding. A company's most recent basic shares outstanding count is typically sourced from the first page of its 10K or its 10Q. And so that's relatively easy information to find out. But you need to calculate, you know, what is the dilutive effect of the in the money options and warrants and the in the money convertible securities. The incremental shares represented by companies in the money options and warrants are calculated in accordance with the treasury stock method, the TSM. Those shares implied by a company's in the money convertible and equity linked securities are calculated in, in accordance with if converted method or the net share settlement method. So for the for the uh, in the money options and warrants, we're using the treasury stock method. And for the in the money convertible securities, we're, we can either use the if converted method or the net sh share settlement method, the NSS method. So we're going to go through each of those. So for the treasury stock, the TSM assumes that all tranches of the in the money options and warrants are exercised at their weighted average strike price with the resulting option proceeds used to repurchase outstanding shares of stock at the company's current share price. In the money options and warrants are those that have an exercise price lower than the current market price of the underlying company's stock. So taking it slow. What does this mean? So essentially, when we're for any balance sheet, we'll actually take a look at uh, a, a real life example. A company in its financial statements will display the different tranches, the different levels of options that it has awarded or will award its employees in the future with a related strike price, which is the exercise price for that respective option, right? So in this case, you know, we're looking at a company, and this is a textbooks example, where the current share price is $20. And so it has basic shares of standing of 100 and in the money options of five of those five uh, in the money options the average strike price needs to be below it to be in the money right it needs to be profitable if it's out of the money if it's above that twenty dollars then it doesn't make sense for you to exercise an option and pay above the current share price because you're losing money by then selling those shares in the open market you want to be exercising below the current share price and so that's what these options are in the money for, right? And their average weighted exercise price is $18. So they're making a $2 profit. So when you're exercising those five, um, five options, you're exercising them and realizing a profit, right? And so we can calculate that. So the option proceeds from selling this. So if you were to sell, if you were to, um, if you were to sell these options, so for the company, from the company's perspective, if you were to sell these five options at this price, the company would receive $90, right? And if you divide that by the current share price, the current market value of those options, and the, the, and the assumption is with the treasury stock method that the company, okay, okay, 
the the obligation of the company when they have an option is that they have to sell a, a share of that company to that employee or option holder at that respective price, right? So not the market price, but the respective exercise price. Now the proceeds from that go to the company themselves because they're still selling a share, but they're selling it at a lower price. So they're not realizing as much. The treasury stock method assumes that the proceeds from that sale are then divided by the current share price. And it assumes that the company is going to use that proceeds to then reduce the existing share count so that whenever they exercise options, it's not all in all the time increasing the, um, the, uh, the amount, basic shares outstanding. They want to make it at least uh, the least dilutive uh, scenario possible because if not, then you know you're diluting existing shareholders and that's really bad. So the company uses that proceeds to then buy back shares at the existing level of twenty dollars a share in this case. And so in this case, the ninety dollars in proceeds from selling five shares at eighteen dollars a share is ninety, and then you divide that by the current share price of twenty to to repurchase four point five shares. Now, if there are five shares from in the money options and the company from the proceeds will buy back 4.5, then the net new shares from the options will only be 0.5. And that's the number that we add back. Now, this is important and maybe you understand already, but for those who don't, once again, so the treasury stock method assumes that the, the shares at the issue, the proceeds go to the company and they use all of those proceeds. They don't hold anything back. They use all of those proceeds to buy back shares in order to reduce the amount of shares issued and the impact of dilution on their existing shareholders. And so in this case, if the proceeds are $90, they divide it by the current share price to determine how much they can buy back. And the difference is what we add to the fully diluted shares of standing count. And so that's the treasury stock method. Okay. Now a frequent question is whether in the treasury stock me uh, method calculation, you include all outstanding options, which includes vested and unvested or only exercisable options. And this is important. This is a huge question in investment banking interviews. If our calculation will be used for a control based valuation methodology, i.e precedent transactions or M&A analysis, we will use all of the options outstanding. If our calculation is for a minority interest based valuation methodology, so a comparable companies analysis, we will, we will only use options exercisable. So in this video, we will only use exercisable options. So what this means is that with the option schedule, there are options that have been vested, which are have already been uh, issued and provided to the existing employees and some that are unvested that will vest over time, which is an incentive for employees to stay on for a longer term, not to just come into the company, pick up options and then exercise them and leave. So, you, you know, there's a vesting schedule. They may be in within three, three quarters or, you know, four quarters, you know, they vest out all the options that they were promised. Right. And so when you are conducting in this video and in this chapter, a comparable companies analysis, you are only considering the options that have been vested. In a scenario where the company is acquired, that is a future obligation, the unvested options. And so you're assuming because the company will not continue anymore because it's being acquired, then you're including those unvested options as well. So that's why you know you either include or don't include depending on the analysis. So for precedent transactions in the next video that I'll produce, you, know, you are including all outstanding options. In this one, it's only exercisable options. Okay, so now let's look at an, an, a real example. Consider a real company, The Score, which is uh, listed on the Canadian Venture Exchange uh, under the ticker symbol SCR. And it's this is its 2017 Q1 option schedule. And so its current share price is uh, 17 cents a share. So, and it's a relatively easy example because only one tranche is, is exercisable in the money, right? So, you know, the it's only profitable to exercise the, you know, 13 cent options. Uh, and there are options outstanding of 3.173 million and the options exercisable, the ones that have been vested are the same. So in this scenario, it's really easy because there are no unvested options at this tranche. So everything has been vested and it's relatively easy to calculate. And it would be no different if we we're using comparable or a precedent transaction analysis, right? And so that's all we have to do. Now we take that number. So based on November 30th, 2016 share price of uh, 17 cents a share, only the uh, 13 cents a share tranche is exercisable with all of those options vested. Now, assuming the 3,173,332 shares are exercised at the 13 uh, cents share, 
Net proceeds from that would be $412,553 to the company. And assuming the company uses these proceeds to repurchase shares at the, current, at the currently traded at 17 cents a share, the score will buy back 2,426,666 shares for net new shares from options of 746,666. And I'm just reading this and I feel that this is confusing and this is not helpful. So I'm actually just gonna pull out a calculator and do this calculation with you right here. Because I feel that this is very, very important. A lot of people, they don't apply, you know, they understand the, the theory behind it, but they don't really apply it to a real world example. So once again, the company is exercising at this level all of these options because all of them have been vested in the comparable companies analysis, right? So the proceeds from selling shares at this price for the score, the company itself, we can just calculate that is 0 0.13 times 1,173,332 shares. And so that will give us proceeds of 412,000. Actually, let me move the, the calculator over here so you can see. Sorry about this. Um, yeah, so that will give us proceeds of that 412,553, okay? Now we're dividing that by the existing share price of $17 a share. So we divide it by 17 to give us a buyback, the amount of shares that have been bought back that have been reduced from that issuance of 2,426,666 shares. So the score will buy back those amount of shares. The difference between those two is essentially this number. And this is the net new shares that are issued considering the treasury stock method, okay? That's pretty much it. Now, the if converted method. In the in the money co converts are converted into additional shares by dividing the convert's amount outstanding by its conversion price. The convert is treated as equity and included in the calculation of the company's fully diluted shares outstanding and equity value. The equity value represented by the convert is calculated by multiplying the new shares outstanding from the conversion by the company's current share price. Accordingly, the convert must be excluded from the calculation of the company's total debt. So let's take a look at an example. So if if $150 is in the money, uh, so there are 150 uh, converts in the money, we can divide the convert amount by the, um, uh, the outs by the conversion price the itself, right? So if there, uh, there's an amount outstanding of convertible equity of $150 and the conversion price on that convertible um, equity is $15, then we all, all we have to do is divide the amount outstanding by the conversion price to calculate incremental new shares of 10. And so we add that to fully diluted shares. And that's pretty much it. So it's relatively easy to understand if converted. Now, net share settlement. So NSS is a newer feature in convertible bonds. For converts issued with a net share settlement feature, the issuer is permitted to satisfy the face value of an in-the-money convert with at least a portion of cash upon conversion. Only the value represented by the excess of the current share price over the conversion price is assumed to be settled with the issuance of additional shares. This results in less share issuance and dilution. So if I have a convert that has a conversion price of $50 and the current share price is $60, the excess, the $10, is what needs to be satisfied with new shares. In this case, you would divide the excess by the existing share price to calculate 0 0.167 new shares need to be issued in that case. Okay, so uh, yeah, so consider the example, blah, blah, blah with $150 um, dollars outstanding and a conversion price of 15. If the current share price is 20, then the extra $5, the difference between the conversion price and the share price needs to be paid back. With no net share settlement, the if converted method would result in 10 new shares because you simply divide you know, the amount outstanding by the conversion price to get 10 new shares. With the net share settlement method, the difference between the value of the incremental shares at the current share price and the value of the incremental shares at the conversion price is paid back in new shares. So essentially, we're taking, so you, you have the amount outstanding divided by the conversion price to give you 10 in, new incremental shares, you multiply that by the current share price to give you a total conversion value of 200. And then you take away the par value. So 10 new shares multiplied by the conversion price itself, which gives you 150. And the difference between that the excess is $50 in this case, right? And dividing that by the new shares, that's the amount that is issued. Right, so that's the that's the actual uh, 
under the net share settlement method, that would be the amount of shares issued. And so as you can see, it's less dilutive relative to the if converted, we're just assuming that you know, all incremental shares are issued. Whereas with the net share settlement, you are calculating the difference between the conversion price and the current share price. And that's what's being paid back in total value terms, right? So we would multiply it by the new existing shares. So once again, we have new existing shares of 10. Okay, the difference between the conversion price and the share price is $5, we can multiply five times 10 to give you 50. And then we divide that number by the existing share price to calculate the amount of incremental shares. And so the, that excess value is what's being paid back under the NSS method. Okay, so now enterprise value, enterprise value is the sum of all ownership interest in a company and claims on its assets from both debt and equity holders, enterprise value is considered independent of capital structure, meaning that changes in a company's capital structure do not affect its enterprise value. So the enterprise value equals equity value plus total debt plus preferred stock plus non controlling interest minus cash and equivalents. And the really important thing here, and the reason why enterprise value multiples are more frequently used in equity value multiples is because it is considered independent of capital structure. It includes both equity value and debt, right? So when you're comparing different companies, different companies have adopted different capital structures. And so by using the enterprise value, you're, you're conducting an unbiased comparison. So it's an apple, apples to apples comparison. Whereas if you were to use an equity value multiple, you would that equity value is influenced by the, inter, uh, the capital structure of the company. So let's look at you know, that unbiased nature. So if a company raises additional debt, the increase in total debt is offset by an increase in cash and equivalents. So this formula, so in any changes, so say, for example, you add debt, you know, that increase in debt will be offset by the cash proceeds that originate from that new debt, right? So they would offset each other and therefore enterprise value would remain the same. It's the same thing for a company that issues equity to pay off debt. So if a company issues a new equity, you know, to to, so their equity value uh, increases. So in this case, so another example is if the company issues equity to pay off debt, the increase in equity value is offset by the decline in total debt. So if the company issues equity, the equity value, it would increase, but but total debt would decrease because that equity that those proceeds are used to pay off total debt. And so the changes would offset each other and therefore enterprise value would not change. So in a scenario where you know total debt is paid off or total debt increases, those changes are offset and enterprise value remains the same. And that's why it is considered independent of capital structure and a better way to compare different companies with different capital structures. Now, a big question is what is minority interest? So looking at this calculation, we have the non-controlling interest, the minority interest that needs to be included in enterprise value. So when a company owns more than 50% of another company, US accounting rules state that the parent company reflects 100% of the assets and liabilities and 100% of financial performance of the majority owned subsidiary on its its own financial statements. Enterprise value is used to create valuation ratios and metrics. When we take say sales or EBITDA from the parent company's financial statements, these figures due to the accounting consolidation will contain 100% of the subsidiary's sales or EBITDA. In order to counteract this, we need to add to enterprise value the value of the subsidiary that the parent company does not own the minority interest. By doing this, both the numerator and the denominator of our valuation metric account for 100% of the subsidiary. And this is why we add the minority interest. This is a more technically advanced question but also something important to understand and, and the reason why we add minority interest. So now comparing equity value with enterprise value. When building the comparable analysis and determining what ratios to use, it is important to understand the difference between equity value and enterprise value. Multiples based on enterprise value are widely used by bankers because they are independent of capital structure and other factors unrelated to business operations. This helps in setting up a more fair environment to compare companies. And I've already said this, but this is really important to understand for those who maybe this is more of an introductory level kind of discussion. Okay. So now let's look at size and the key financial data used to communicate size. So there are two comments. EBITDA, a widely used EBITDA is a widely used uh, proxy for operating cash flow as it reflects the company's total cash operating costs for producing its products independent of financing costs and non-cash charges. And EBIT is independent of the tax regime and serves as a useful metric for comparing companies with different capital structures. So the Important comments to take away from this are essentially the earnings before interest tax, depreciation, and amortization, and earnings before interest and tax are different me metrics 
from a financial perspective that are used to really capture the operating cash flow. And, and a lot of bankers prefer EBITDA more than EBIT from an operating cash flow perspective because it is independent of non-cash charges like depreciation and amortization. And both are independent of the financing regime, the different capital structures that companies might assume. And so when you are you know, when we're talking about equity value versus enterprise value, the important thing to remember is that for enterprise value multiples, the lowest you can go on the income statement is EBIT. If you go beyond EBIT, what happens is, you know, if you're including the interest tr uh, charges, you know, then the financing effect occurs, right? You know, the interest expenses related to, you know, the different capital structures of the company will impact the metric and therefore using a unbiased metric like e, uh, uh, like en enterprise value and using a metric like net income would not make sense. So anything above EBIT and including EBIT is used as a uh, multiple using enterprise value. Anything below EBIT and not including EBIT would be used with equity value. So equity value to uh, net income can be used because equity value is impacted by the company structure and uh, net income is also impacted by the uh, company's capital structure because it's including the charges related to financing costs. So that's really important to understand. So some profitability metrics, you know, you can calculate the gross profit margin, uh, you know, which is sales minus COGS divided by sales. There's the EBITDA margin, so you divide EBITDA by sales. There's the EBIT margin, the EBIT divided by sales, and there's the net income margin, which is a net income divided by sales. There's also um, the return on invested capital, which measures the return generated by all capital provided to a company. EBIT is used because it represents operating income for both debt and equity holders. So your return, their, your ROIC would be EBIT divided by average net debt plus equity. So that is the total capital provided, right? So total capital includes debt and equity, and that is average net debt plus equity. And the like, like I said, EBIT is that measure that includes the op, which represents the operating income uh, to, that goes directly to EBIT, the debt and uh, equity holders. So that's the calculation for that for return on equity, or uh, uh, it's net income divided by average shareholders equity, and return on assets is net income divided by average total assets. So these are all multiples that you might understand. But once again, just a quick review there. There's also leverage metrics. So you have the debt to EBITDA or the leverage ratio, which is debt divided by EBITDA. There's also the debt to total capitalization. So you have debt divided by uh, debt plus preferred stock plus not controlling interest plus equity, right? And there's also the interest coverage ratio. And this is an important multiple that a lot of people use. And that is just uh, EBITDA. Either you can use EBITDA, you know, the difference between EBITDA and CAPEX, which is a cash charge or EBIT and divide that by interest expense to get your interest coverage ratio. Okay, so now an important thing for the financial data is when you are ca using these numbers. So when you're choosing to use, uh, you know, EBITDA, or you're choosing to use the interest expense, you know, you have to use the last 12 months, the LTM of that financial metric, right? So U US public filers are required to report their financial performance on a quarterly basis, including a full year report filed at the end of the fiscal year. Therefore, in order to measure financial performance for the most recent annual or last 12 month period, the company's financial results from the previous four quarters are summed up, right? So it would be easy if you're doing an analysis at year end because you can just take the annual report and use those numbers. But say, for example, you're doing an analysis in Q2 of that respective company's uh, you know, fiscal calendar, then you have to still take the last 12 months performance, the annual performance in the last 12 months, and use that measure to calculate those multiples and, and, and the different metrics that you'll be using in your analysis. And so to calculate the last 12 month multiple, all you have to do is take the prior, first, prior fiscal year. So you take the last annual results, add the current stub. So if it's in Q2, you add Q1 and Q2 data, and then you take away uh, Q1 and Q2 data of the last year, right? So say, for example, we're in currently in 2017. So imagine that we're currently in uh, Q2 of 2017. We take the 2016 results for that company. We would add the Q1 and Q2 of 2017 performance for the company. And then we take away the Q1 and Q2 2016 performance of that company to calculate the last 12 month performance of that respective metric, whether it's EBITDA or EBIT or, you know, interest expense or whatever it is. Okay. 
And so here's an illustration of that. You know, essentially you have the prior fiscal year, which is you know Q1 through Q4 of 2011, and this is assuming that we're in Q3 of 2012, right? Then we take the current stub in in 2012, so Q1 to Q3 in 2012, we add that, and then we take away Q1 to Q3 of 2011. So it's relatively easy to understand. Okay, and here's a real life example. So this is JMP Group LLC. This is a company that I'm actually looking at right now for research purposes. Uh, they are a small cap investment bank in the US market. And, uh, you know, and so they were calculating the last 12 month uh, revenue figure. Okay. And so this is the annual uh, revenue figure of the prior fiscal year. So they made $134 million, the current stub of this past quarter. So this is Q1. So Q1 of 2017, they reported $24 million. So I add that to this number. And then the prior stub, so the Q1 of 2016, I take away this number to get la last 12 month mo uh, revenues for this respective company, JMP Group, of 120 million based in Q1 of 2017. So we've exhausted this calculation. You should probably understand it by now. Okay, another thing, calendarization of financial data. The majority of US public filers report their financial performance in accordance with a fiscal year ending December 31st, which corresponds to the calendar year end. Some companies, however, report on a different schedule, maybe fiscal years ending April 30th. Any variation in fiscal year ends among comparable companies must be addressed for benchmarking purposes. Otherwise, the trading multiples will be based on financial data for different periods and therefore not truly comparable. And so really just to understand this and why there might be a bias, say, for example, you're looking at a company that earns majority of its revenue in Q4 right? And then you decide that you want to compare Q4 numbers. Well, if you're comparing a company that, you know, in so say, for example, this one company reports on, you know, year end December 31st, and then the other reports year end April 30th. So if you're looking at the first company, you're saying, okay, their strongest quarter is in the final period, right? And then you're comparing that to that quarter for this company, that would be Q2, not Q4. And that would be unfair. You want to compare Q4 to Q4 data. You want to compare Q3 to Q3 data and so on, right? And so you need to calendarize the, the financial data. And so to do so, whatever metric you are using, so in this case, it's the next calendar year, CY sales, so the sales figure, you take the current, the, the month number refers to the month in which the company's fiscal year ends. So in this case, we'd be calendarizing the April 30th company, right? So if it ends in April 30th, then that's the fourth month. And so you you put in four times the company's for, uh, forward year uh, sales, annual sales, and you multiply that four by that sales figure, and then you divide it by 12, and then you add the difference. So 12 minus four, so it'd be eight times the next year's sales figure divided by 12 and add that up to calculate the next calendar year's sales. And so you've calendarized their sales data. So that's pretty much it. Uh, there are a lot of other resources that you can look in examples. I didn't want to do that right now because the, the presentation is always too already too long. But here's a quick example. So, so say for example, you know uh, the current the annual um, sales data for 2012 is a thousand dollars, and for 2013 it's expected to be one thousand one hundred fifty dollars. And so if they report in uh, in April 30th on April 30th, then you multiply it by four divided by 12 plus eight, the difference between 12 minus four, multiply it by the expected uh, annual sales figure of $1,150 divided by 12 to get a calendarized sales figure of $1,100. Okay. So also you need to make adjustments for non recurring items. So to assess a company's financial performance on a normalized basis, it is standard practice to adjust fi uh, reported financial data for non recurring items. Failure to do so may lead to the calculation of misleading ratios and multiples, which in turn may produce a distorted view of valuation. These adjustments involve the add back or elimination of one time charges and gains. And this is very important to make sure that your data is reflecting the normal business cycle. Typical charges include those incurred for restructuring events such as 
store plant closings and headcount reduction, losses on asset sales, changes in accounting principles, inventory write-offs, goodwill impairment. That's a big one, especially if a company has acquired, uh, has made a recent acquisition. They've they've reduced that the amount of goodwill on their balance sheet or an extinguishment of debt and losses from litigation settlements, among others. Typical benefits include gain gains from asset sales, favorable litigation settlements, and tax adjustments, among others. So the reason you're adjusting for non-recurring items is because um, it it is a bias towards the actual performance, the real performance of the company's net income measure or you know EBIT measure. And so you want to make sure that when you're using that EBIT, you're assuming it's normalized business, so adjusted for non-recurring items. Okay. So when adjusting for non-recurring items, it is important to distinguish between the pre-tax and after-tax amounts. For a pre-tax restructuring charge, for example, the full amount is simply added back to calculate the adjusted EBIT and EBITDA. To calculate adjusted net income, however, the pre-tax restructuring charge needs to be tax affected before being added back. Conversely, for after-tax amounts, the disclosed amount is simply added back to net income, but must be grossed up by the company's tax rate before being added back to EBIT and EBITDA. And this is a little granular, uh, granular, but it's important to understand. If you are making adjustments, a majority of them are pre-tax restructuring charges. Essentially, when you are you know, making that adjustment to net income, you have to uh, tax effect that adjustment. So if the if the company wrote down a pre-tax charge of one thousand dollars and the company's um, tax rate is thirty percent, then the adjustment to net income would be you know seventy percent of that. So it would be seven hundred dollars. Okay, so that's important to understand. So consider two one-time charges. This is an example: a one five million pre-tax inventory write down and a restructuring expense of 10 million pre-tax. Provided the banker is confident that these are non-recurring because that's a big question. You have to ask yourself, are these, you know, uh, non-cash items non-recurring or are they recurring? And there are some examples. The best one is litigation fees for pharmaceutical companies. That's part of doing business. They're always going in and out of court. So you might not want to define that as non-recurring. Right. So there are some some again, that's at the discretion of the banker and it, it's based on the experience of the banker. So let's adjust EBIT and EBITDA and diluted EPS for this respective company. Right. So both of these charges are pre-tax and can be simply added back to EBITDA. Right. So for the inventory charge, let's take a look here. So where do these charges where should be these charges be reported? So in the inventory write down would be in the cog section. And the restructuring charge has its own line item. So it's already right over here. And so you can see that we have a 10 million restructuring charge. That's the number over there. And there is a 5 million uh, write down, right? So what we can do now is adjust it, right? So if there's a write down, um, our cost of goods would have increased. And so we want to adjust that. So we're lowering COGS. So we're taking away the 5 million charge to make COGS 620 instead of 625. And for uh, for the restructuring charge, you're looking at that 10, uh, 10 million charge, and you're taking that away to make it zero now. And so essentially, those two charges will impact your operating income, your EBIT, right? So you add the two, which are total up to 15 million, you add that to EBIT, and that means adjusted EBIT is 150 instead of 135. And for adjusted EBITDA, you're now uh, adding back depreciation and amortization plus uh, EBIT, right? Just because we've all, we already calculated adjusted EBIT, so we all we have to do is add back depreciation and amortization, which in this case would be uh, which would be 50, 50, right? To get adjusted EBIT of 200. So. Once again, so adjusting for non-recurring items, we have to determine whether they're pre-tax or after-tax. In, in this case, both of the charges, the inventory write-down and the restructuring charge, both pre-tax, the restructuring charge falls under the cost of goods sold. And so we're taking away a $5 million from the cost of goods because in, a, in the case of an inventory write-down, our costs are increasing. So COGS would be would have increased because of this charge. So we're reducing COGS by $5 million, And for the restructuring charge, we're taking away the $10 million, which is reported right over here, and we're turning it to zero. And so this $15 million combined non-recurring item needs to adjust EBIT, right? So the adjusted EBIT, we have to add back that 15 million that was charged to, to adjust EBIT to 150. And so on a normalized basis, the company would really be earning in this case $150 instead of 135 if they weren't re reporting these non recurring items. Okay, so now let's look at the equity value multiples. So price to earnings, the ratio or the equity value to net income, so EV to NI multiple, which are both the same thing, 
This ratio illustrates how much an investor is willing to pay for a dollar of a company's current or future earnings. P.E. ratios are typically based on forward year EPS as investors are focused on future growth. Companies with higher P.E.s than their peers tend to have higher earnings growth expectations. So essentially, from an equity value multiples perspective, this is probably the most common and only multiple that will be used in the comparable companies analysis. It's equity value to net income right? That's the better metric to use. So once you've calculated your equity value, which is, you know, total equity plus uh, total debt plus minority interest per preferred stock minus cash and equivalents, and you calculate your adjusted net income, if there are any non-recurring items, you can then calculate that multiple. And you're using either the uh, forward year, the expected earnings, so it's the, uh, the projected net income of the company, or you're using the current last 12 month uh, earnings of, of that respective company. Okay, so the two limits of using this multiple are one, because it is referencing net income, financing costs, and thus the capital structure impacts the denominator. So comparing companies with different capital structures is unfair. And if the company has low or zero earnings, the measure is useless for analysis. So these are the two downsides to EV to NI. The multiple itself is biased in the sense of financing costs. And at the same time, usually for, you know, kind of, uh, pre-profitable companies or technology companies, there might not, they might not have net income, right, to report, right, they might report negative um, net income, and then the multiple itself is useless, and so you have to go higher up on the income statement, okay? Now, from an enterprise value multiples perspective, given that enterprise value represents the interests of both debt and equity holders, it is used as a multiple of unlevered financial statistics, such as sales, EBITDA, and EBIT, and I talked about this. So for enterprise value, you're looking at EBIT and above, not below. If you're looking below, then net income would be uh, impacted by financing costs, and therefore, you know, you're not looking at a fair apples apples comparison. So the two common multiples and the most common ones are EV to EBITDA and EV to EBIT. So enterprise value to EBITDA and enterprise value to EBIT. And these serve as a valuation standard for most sectors. It is independent of capital structure and taxes, as well as any distortions that may arise from differences in depreciation and amortization among different companies. Okay. So enterprise value to sales multiples are another multiple and an enterprise value multiple. So EV to S is used as, also as a valuation metric, although it is typically less relevant than other multiples discussed. Sales may provide an indication of size, but it does not necessarily translate into profitability or cash flow generation, both of which are, very, are key value drivers. And then there's also sector specific multiples using the enterprise value multiple. So many sectors employ specific valuation multiples in addition to or instead of the traditional metrics previously discussed. These multiples use an indicator of market valuation in the numerator and a key sector specific financial operating or production capacity statistic in the denominator. And so we'll actually take a look at this. So items that are affected by the capital structure, you would use the uh, equity value. So you could do equity value to book value, equity value to, uh, to cash available for distribution, uh, equity value to discretionary cash flow, and equity value to, to net asset value or net income. And for enterprise value, you can use, um, you know, uh, broadcast cash cash flow. So these are more uh, sector specific measures. And these are for more of the advanced things. But at the very core, at the foundation of the comparable companies analysis, the most common equity value multiple is equity value to net income. And the most common enterprise value multiples would be enterprise value to EBITDA, enterprise value to EBIT, uh, and sometimes enterprise value to sales. But once again, that is not usually dependent on most of the time. So now step four, we benchmark the comparable companies. So once the initial universe of comparable companies is selected and key financial statistics, ratios, and trading multiples are spread, the banker is set to perform benchmarking analysis. Benchmarking centers on analyzing and comparing each of the comparable companies with one another in the target. The ultimate objective is to determine the target's relative ranking so as to frame valuation accordingly. So you benchmark the financial statistics and ratios, and then you benchmark the trading multiples. So financial statistics and ratios would be, you know, the the EBITDA margin, the uh, the uh, gross profit margin, you know, the interest coverage ratio, all these kind of financial statistics that determine the, the ind independent strength of the company. And then the trading multiples would be the EV to EBITDA, EV to EBIT multiples that you're comparing. And so those benchmarks, you know, you can then calculate the means and, and, and medians of those to really then get a better sense of, you know, what, what the, the, expected benchmark is, right? So in step five, you're determining the valuation. So the, the trading multiples for the comparable companies serve as the basis for deriving an appropriate valuation range for the target, right? So we're we're spreading and we're, you know, benchmarking the financial statistics and trading multiples. But 
you know, we're using the financial statistics to draw insight with regards to the comparable companies. When we're determining valuation, we're using trading multiples, not financial statistics. And so the trading multiples serve as the basis for deriving an appropriate valuation range for the target. The banker typically begins by using the means and medians of the most relevant multiple for the sector, whether it's EV to EBITDA or price to equity, uh, price to earnings, sorry, to extrapolate a defensible range of multiples. The high and low multiples of the comparables universe provide further guidance. So in this case, they, that the ex textbook provided, you know, you look at they were comparing the uh, enterprise value to EBITDA, the EV to EBITDA multiple range. And they saw that, you know, based on you know their discretion, they decided that, you know, the closest comparable company is company A. And so they were on the lower end of the range. So 6.5 times X. So it'd be 6.5 times the EV to EBITDA multiple, whereas, you know, the uh, another close comparable would be company C, and that's up, up on the higher range. And so in this case, you know, the banker decides that, you know, the company, they're not going to give a specific number, they're going to give a valuation range. And so it ranges between 6.5x and 7.5x EV to EBITDA. Okay, and also you have the high and lows of each of, of each of the comparable companies, although those are more of, you know, guideposts more than actual real valuable projections, because it would not be beneficial for the banker to project 5.5x EV to EBITDA, or it would be just, you know, very um, unrealistic to project 8.5x EV to EBITDA. Okay, and so now we can take those multiples and imply a valuation based on that multiple. So consider the 6.5x to 7.5x multiple range for 2012 expected EBITDA. To calculate implied equity value, we subtract net debt of 500 million from enterprise value, then divide by fully diluted shares outstanding to get the implied share price. This methodology can be used for EV to uh, last 12 month EBITDA and EV to the expected 2013 EBITDA as well. So essentially, the moment, so we've gone through the process, let's, let's just quickly summarize, we've gone through the process, we've determined, you know, we've learned about the company, then we've determined what the key comparable companies are, which are the most relevant, we've then calculated the financial ratios and inputted the multiples. And then we've benchmarked those ratios and calculated the averages and implied that there is a range between 6.5x and 7.5x multiple range for EV to EBITDA, right? And that can be based on the multiple for the existing LTM, the last 12 months, it can be based on the expected EBITDA of the next following fiscal year of 2012 or 2013. So you can base it on projections as well. Now, once you multiply and you decide, hey, let's go right in the middle. So let's go 7x EV to EBITDA for 2012, the expected 2012 EV to EBITDA multiple. We can then imply that enterprise value range and we can imply that enterprise value, then take away 500. So in the case of last 12 months for or the last 12 months, EBITDA, EBITDA, right, if we're range between seven and, and eight X, you know, we can take away the five hundred dollars, uh, the five hundred in uh, net debt to bring it back to equity value to get our implied equity value between nine hundred and one thousand five hundred. And we divide by fully diluted shares to get an implied share price range of nine dollars to eleven dollars. And so that's how we take that enterprise value projected enterprise value and we bring it down to the most realistic projection number that we want our client to see, which is the implied share price of the company. Okay. And so we can also imply it based on other things like price, uh, price to earnings. So consider a PE multiple range of 12 to 15 X, you know, the 20 at 12 expected net income. It is much simpler to get the final implied share price, because in this case, you know, we're, we're using, this is the equity value to net income multiple, right? So in this case, you know, it's much easier because we're not using enterprise value and we don't have to convert it back. So if we use an equity value multiple, then when we're implying our valuation, all we have to do is, you know, take that range and then divide it by fully diluted shares to get the implied share price range as well. So this is, you know, different ways that we can, you know, project the valuation of the company. And finally, this is the last two slides of the video. So what are the over a quick overview? What are the advantages of the comparable companies analysis? A, it's market based information is used to derive valuation is based on the actual market data and thereby reflecting the market's growth and risk expectations today. It's all also relatively easy and uh, to measure and compare other companies to your target company. It is quick and convenient, it doesn't take that long. And there are not that, that many assumptions to make other than you know, choosing the right comparable companies. And it is very current. So the valuation is based on prevailing market data, which can be updated on a daily or intraday basis. Now, what are the disadvantages? In addition, 
although it is market based and the information is derived from current expectations, those expectations might be off. They might be very biased because we're in a boom, uh, boom or bust cycle. And so if we are at the highs or the lows of a respective market, then the current valuation of that company and its comparables will give off a a very biased number, which might not be correct. Also, there might be an absence of relevant comparables. So there are no true pure play comparables out there. So really, you're making the assumption that if I compare Coca-Cola to Pepsi, that, you know, like, at the end of the day, I'm basing Coca-Cola's valuation on Pepsi, even though Pepsi might have a foods, a much larger foods division, and its performance might be derived from other markets than Coca-Cola. So once again, it's really, really important to select the correct universe of comparable companies. But at the same time, it's almost impossible to select the perfect companies. There's also a potential disconnect from cash flow. In many markets, you know, investors in the current share price don't really reflect the fundamental value if you were to conduct a discounted cash flow analysis. But again, it's part of the toolkit and you're you're providing a range for your client. So this is another way to confirm a relative range for the client. So you can also use a discounted cash flow model in line with the comparable company's analysis to provide that range. And at the same time, there might be company specific issues that will create deviation in the valuation range. So once again, if you're comparing Coca-Cola to Pepsi, maybe Pepsi is going through some management changes, or it's facing some lawsuits that might not be impacting you know, Coca-Cola because it's a company specific issue. And so in that case, even though the companies might be very similar, there are issues that will deviate the valuation away from what is considered once again a pure play comparable and so that is again one of the big disadvantages so that's pretty much it i've been talking for a very very long time so please 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 like the video subscribe to the channel if you do have any questions please comment below i will be sure to get back to you this is what i love i love talking about this stuff you know i am going into the investment banking space and i love the sector and as always, I have a lot of other videos covering, uh, you know, initial public offerings, investment banking, you know, this, the discounted cash flow analysis. You know, that's my favorite kind of methodology to use. So I'm going to make be making a lot more videos on that as well. So if you do like this video and you found it helpful, please subscribe to the channel for more. And if you have any questions, please comment below. And that's pretty much it, guys. Thanks for watching. Thanks for sticking it all through and have a nice day. Thank you.